Sergeants, please start your recording. Computer recording started. Pad recording all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Polite, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on the Committee on Environmental Protection. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may sing your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Costa Constantinidis. I am chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. And today we will hear intros uh, 1576, which calls for increasing penalties for failure to comply with backflow prevention requirements, and intro 2170 in relation to sustainable energy loan program. Uh, from 1981 to 1998, uh, the CDC documented 57 waterborne disease and outbreaks related to backflow incidents due to cross connections, resulting in close to 10,000 illnesses. Uh, these include 20 outbreaks by, caused by micro, micro bio, biological contamination, 15 outbreaks, about 680 cases of illness caused by chemical contamination, and 22 outbreaks, about 2,700 of them uh, that caused illness where the contaminant was not reported. Uh, backflow devices prevent cross connections between potable and no, non potable water. Uh, 10 NYCRR section 5-1-31 directs a supplier of, of water to protect the, the public water supply from potential contamination within the premises of the water user. In order to carry out some responsibility pursuant to the public health law, the Department of Environmental Protection or DEP as a supplier of water must determine if a facility does pose a hazard due to its operations. If so, the commissioner is required to direct the owner to install an approved backflow prevention device. However, if the building owner fails to comply with the directive of the commissioner, he or she is subject to enforcement actions, such as cease and desist orders, civil or criminal actions, fines, penalties, and even ultimately termination of water supply of the building or any portion of the facility. Despite New York City's local laws requiring the installation of backflow devices on certain properties, many building owners simply have not complied with the laws. In contrast, in Boston, Massachusetts, the backflow prevention program performs 11,000 site inspections per year. All surveys go to the last free throwing outlet, regardless of whether the facility is considered high or low hazard, as required by state cross connection control regulations. Under this program, 100% of all high hazard sites have installed protections. This high level of testing has ensured the city's potable water supply is protected from backflow related contamination events. If potable water is mixed with non potable water, the results can be disastrous. That's why the penalties for failure to install backflow de device must be increased. Uh, potable and non potable water must never be mixed in the city's potable water network distribution. In 2019, as part of the Climate Mobilization Act, New York City passed Local Law 96 of 2019, creating the Sustainable Energy Loan Program intended to assist property owners who wish to implement energy efficient and renewable energy projects at their properties. The Property Assessed Clean Energy Program, or we'll call it ACE today, so we don't have to say all that, uh, offered affordable financing that allows property owners to pay for upgrades that improve energy efficiency, harness renewable energy, and conserve water. Without energy efficiency and renewable energy, we have no path to a sustainable future. PACE allows a property owner to finance the upfront cost of energy or eligible improvements on a property and then pay the cost back over time through a voluntary assessment. The unique characteristic of PACE assessments that the assessments attach to the property rather than the individual. PACE programs enable property owners to avoid high upfront costs related to installing clean energy technologies such as solar panels or energy saving retrofits. The PACE financing program allows uh, access to low interest and uh, long-term loans. Property owners may also see reduced energy bills. 
grace programs allow property owners to pay for these improvements over time through assessment on their property tax bills. Once a property owner opts into a PACE uh, financing program, the property remains subject to the PACE arrangement, even if it's sold, transferred, or per, uh, foreclosed upon. The remainder of the assessment is a lien on the property. 2170 would amend the previously enacted Sustainable Energy Loan Program to, perfit, to permit energy efficient improvements to be incorporated into real property as an improvement or component of a new or existing building. Uh, before I begin, I wanna thank all of our staff. I wanna thank our committee counsel, Samara Swanston, our poly, policy analyst, Nadia Johnson and Ricky Chalwa, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, my legislative counsel, uh, Nicholas Wazowski for all of their hard work. I wanna welcome uh, my good friend, Jamani Williams, uh, who I believe also has a our, our public advocate who has an opening statement as well. So Mr. Public Advocate at this time, if you'd like to give your, public, uh, your, your statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you for uh, your leadership on these issues throughout the years. I appreciate it. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Jermani Williams. I'm a public advocate for the city of New York. Once again, thank you, Chair Constantinides for holding today's hearing. Our city must do more to address environmental injustice. The longer we wait to correct these problems, the worse off communities, particularly communities of more color, uh, will be. I'm proud that one of my uh, first four bills in my first term actually had to do with environmental justice. And I'm glad to see uh, in these communities uh, getting even stronger in pushing for uh, these kind of concerns. Therefore, uh, we need to aggress be aggressive and proactive in offering solutions. This, the bills before the committee today are examples of that. My bill, intro number 1576, first introduced by Queens Ball President Donovan Richards, uh, would increase penalties for a building owner or an operator failing to install and report on water backflow prevention devices. Failure to either install the device or annually report on tests could mean either a significantly higher civil penalty or criminal fine. Backflow, backflow prevention uh, devices stop contamination from entering New York City's water. Without them, bacteria such as salmonella can spread into water pipes. For businesses such as laundromats, food processing plants, supermarkets, and large residential dwellings, this is pretty dangerous. Anyone can experience serious harm. So contamination must be avoided at all costs. This is both an environmental issue and a public health issue. In 2019, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection estimated that there were 76,472 facilities in the city that required one or more backflow prevention devices. Notably, 45,093, or roughly 59%, uh, are considered hazardous facilities. Therefore, a device must be installed and annually reported on with no excuse. Otherwise, the risk can be severe for occupants, customers, or workers. There were 1,540 violations in 2018 for failure to install a backflow prevention device, according to DEP. The number of violations for not filing a report is even higher at 8,780. This is why the legislation is necessary. This prevention device are vital, devices are vital for New Yorkers. This cannot be done out of convenience. It is a requirement. There are steep penalties for those who do not follow this law. There is an additional concern with the existing penalties and fines. At the committee's June 25th, 2018 hearing, it was said that these prevention devices can cost anywhere between $3,000 to $20,000. Therefore, if fines are lowered, then the owner or operator can just accept the fine as the cheaper option. The legislation would eliminate that with steeper penalties and fines. New Yorkers must be guaranteed protection and this bill ensures that. I anticipate administration support for the bill today uh, to send a message of accountability. We cannot accept failure to submit an annual report or failure to install these prevention devices. New Yorkers must be given assurances that the health is being prioritized. Finally, just wanna join in supporting uh, the chair's intro number 2170 to amend the sustainable energy loan program to improve energy efficiency in New York City. Any opportunity to do so is useful and reiterates the city's commitment to make a greener New York City. Energy efficiency may be costly for some building owners, so there must be assistance for everyone who is interested in energy efficiency. Overall, the bills represent our commitment for a cleaner, safer New York City. I thank the chair again for both allowing me to speak and for co-sponsoring my legislation, and of course, for his leadership on all of these issues. Uh, I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. I always appreciate uh, your work and uh, both in the council and now as a public advocate, your commitment to making New York City more green and more sustainable and a better place for all. So thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Uh, Samara, it's uh, 
please take over. Okay, thank you. I'm Samara Swanston, Counsel to the Environmental Protection Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be calling on, you will be on mute until you're called on to testify when you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please be aware that there could be a, a delay in muting and unmuting you, so please be patient. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We'll begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the council, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. We will be limiting council member questions to four minutes, including responses. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, use the Zoom raise hand function, and I'll call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions, as I said before, to four minutes. Um, um, <clears throat> and now <clears throat> I will deliver the oath to the administration and call on each of you individually to be followed by your testimony. Please raise your right hands. We will begin with MOS Acting Direct Director Kate Gowan, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? I do. Thank you. And now, Deputy Commissioner uh, Mike Deloach uh, of Public Affairs and Communication. Michael, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin to testify when ready. Samara, do you want Kate or I to start, or does it make a difference? Uh, well, you can start if you'd like, uh, and then be followed by Kate. Great. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Public Advocate, uh, Councilman Menchaca. It's nice to see everybody. My name is Michael Deloach. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Affairs at the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on intro 1576, which reinforces the importance of water backflow prevention devices. Uh, these devices, also known as cross-connection controls, prevent potential contamination within premises from entering the public water supply. The possibility of contamination is caused by various kinds of plumbing configurations and or equipment that we that use water under pressure. If the water pressure in the internal system in say a medical facility like, an, like a hospital is greater than the pressure in the public water supply system, dangerous chemicals can be inadvertently forced back into the public supply unless a properly functioning black backflow prevention device is in place to keep that from happening. Protection, protection of our drinking water through the mandated cross-connection control program, which is required by the New York State Sanitary, is required by the New York State Sanitary, Sanitary Code. The code contained in the public health law mandates that public law, that public water suppliers such as DEP require certain users to install cross-connection controls for which they must submit plans for the installation of the devices. And they must do annual testing and reporting, reporting once the devices have been installed. This program is approved and reviewed annually by the state and the city Department of Health and is reportable to the Uni United States Environmental Protection Agency and the New York State Health Department as one of the filtration avoidance determination deliverables. The bill today strengthens this program by raising the fines for failing to comply with the law so that the fine is comparable to the cost of installation. DEP supports this bill and we look forward to talking about it today, testifying, uh, and discussing the importance of this bill. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, before Kate, before you go, I just wanna recognize that we've been joined by both uh, council members Dharma Diaz and Carlos Menchaca from Brooklyn. Thank you. Great, thank you Chair Constantinides and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. 
My name is Kate Gouin, and I'm very excited to join you for the first time in my new role as Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I will offer testimony today in support of Introduction 2170, which would expand the previously authorized Property Assessed Clean Energy, or PACE, financing program to include newly constructed buildings. Local Law 96 of 2019, part of the Climate Mobilization Act, authorized what is called CPACE, or commercial pace lending here in New York City. Uh, as uh, Chair Constantinides mentioned, um, CPACE financing is private financing that can be secured to pay for energy efficiency upgrades to a multifamily or commercial building that is tied to the property, not to the person securing the financing, and that is paid back through the property tax bill. This financing provides an essential tool to help building owners acquire the capital they need to upgrade their buildings to comply with Local Law 97. These upgrades will also help buildings function more efficiently and will make them more comfortable and healthy for residential and commercial tenants. Since Local Law 96 was passed, we have been working closely with the New York City Department of Finance and the Law Department to establish the rules and structure for our program, and we anticipate that building owners will be able to seek PACE financing for their projects in the coming months. In 2020, the New York State Legislature expanded the statewide authorization for PACE to make new construction eligible for PACE financing. Introduction 2170 would provide the necessary local authorization for us to be able to expand the city's PACE program to include new buildings. As our city faces compounding crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and its accompanying economic crisis, the climate crisis, and systemic crises of housing quality and affordability, especially for our most vulnerable populations, we must address them using all of the tools at our disposal. Expanding the PACE program to include new construction allows private lenders to offer capital that would enable building developers, designers, and owners to incorporate measures that exceed the New York City Energy Code, which means that everything from new healthcare facilities to newly constructed affordable and supportive housing could be built in a way that acknowledges and confronts the climate crisis. This will also support jobs in our green and just recovery. To conclude, we strongly support Introduction 2170, and we look forward to working with the Council to, de to determine a cost-neutral way to implement the bill. We know that we will need to engage as many New Yorkers as possible to fight the climate crisis. We are united in our work with the Council to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Thank you. I look forward to answering your questions. Kate, welcome. Uh, congratulations you. on your new role. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're going to miss Mark. We know you're going to do an amazing job. Thank you. We're going to miss Mark, too. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited for you and excited to have you in the new role and look forward to all the good work that you're going to do. Likewise. Uh, Thank you. So I just wanted to ask, I'm, I'm looking at your testimony. In what way do you expect, does the administration expect this bill to be somehow cost, you know, costly to the city, right? I mean, I, I'm... I'm a little perplexed about that second to last line. So what, yep. what's the issue Under, here? <laughs> understandable, understandable. So as you know, um, the way the PACE program itself is structured, the more buildings we get into the program, the faster the program will pay for itself. So that is not, the, implementing the actual program is not the concern. The piece that we're looking into is the administrative piece on the Department of Finance side. We're not anticipating that being significant. We just need a little bit more time to analyze. Okay. I mean, I think that have we you said we haven't issued any pace financing loans as of yet, correct? The program's not up and running. We that's right. We have not issued any loans. Do we when do we expect the loans to start flowing? I mean, what what are we thinking here? We're hoping to launch the program sometime in April. Okay, so just in time for Earth Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time for birth. Okay. Um, and and this 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 works, right? Other jurisdictions have done it, and it's been it's been a great addition to uh, fighting climate change, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Currently, there's 37 states and Washington D.C. that have passed pace enabling legislation, and 22 states that have active commercial pace programs. So we know that it can be really successful. Okay. And 
And what do you do if we pass 2170 uh, in the near future, would that impact the ability to get this off the ground on time or, or is it just gonna be seamless transition into, you know, it just sort of help new building owners, new buildings be incorporated into this program? Uh, the, the latter is correct. So it shouldn't affect the program at all. It's just going to increase the number of buildings that are eligible to apply for the PACE financing. And who's eligible right now? Right now, uh, commercial and multifamily buildings are eligible, but again, the program hasn't launched, so they'll be able to apply as soon as we launch the program. Okay, and it, okay. Um, I just, I just want to make sure I also, I, I'm getting text messages here, so I want to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Eric Ulrich uh, from Queens, who's also uh, joined today's meeting. Um, so I'm going at this time, I'm gonna ask if there, if Mr. Public Advocate, do you have any questions at all? Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Samara, do we, do we have anyone, with their hands up? Sorry, Kate. No, that's all right. <laughs> uh, I don't see anyone with their hands up. Always oh, good to triple check. Me. I just want to double check because I mean, I'm uh, DEP. I'll, I'll be honest, Mike. Uh, you know, I, I know when to shut up and take a yes. So happy to be supportive. supportive. Yep. <laughs> so you're you're hundred percent support over the bill. No concerns. No complaints. No, I think we're good. Okay, so I want I'm, to I'm, talk a little bit about the fine amounts, just, you know, it's more detail, but we're, we're fine. So I, I think I'm, I'm at the point now where, you know, how are we doing on tracking uh, non-compliance, um, especially so, the era of COVID? Yeah, we, so our numbers are down a little bit this year. Uh, we do about three or 4,000 inspections per year. I think it was like 2,300-ish uh, this past year, um, but we've really ramped up on the enforcement side. Uh, we've been sending out more, uh, uh, you know, commissioners' orders and and making sure that people are aware that they're out of compliance and then going through the oath process. So uh, we've we focus, you know, in since the inspections have taken a little bit of hit, we've we've used some of those resources on more aggressive uh, enforcement opportunities. Do we know how many high hazard buildings still aren't in compliance? Uh, it's really fluid because the use changes, and especially this past year, a lot of uses are changing. But uh, it's roughly about twenty thousand right now that we have outstanding. About twenty thousand, and you've you know through additional inspection and and sort of increase of penalty, do we think that they'll be able to get these twenty thousand buildings into compliance? Yeah, I mean, we're hopeful. I think the the way that we had discussed this in 2018 was that the fines were so low that it was almost like you didn't have to worry about it. So I do think that increasing the fines will be meaningful. And even just hopefully us communicating that through our through our orders and our communications with, with property owners, hopefully will go a long way in, in avoiding having to go through oath and actually doing the notice of violation, just uh, get people to you know pay attention and do what's right. And, and this is in... And we're not giving building owners a hard time here. This is actually a public health problem, right? If the if the water mixes, like right, the cross connections sort of go back, we could have see people in not only that their building, but other buildings become very sick, correct? Yeah, it's absolutely something that we need to require for health and safety. It's important to note since about 1989, um, all new properties have been required to have an architect or uh, you know, an expert to deem if it's important or not, and that's approved by us. And obviously we do, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of sampling of our drinking water to make sure that everything stays safe and we find problems where they exist quickly and rectify it. But yeah, I mean, it's a serious thing and people should, you know, honor the law, honor the intent in the law and make sure that they, they add it to their system. So this is something that you know, if, if you're not installing a backflow device, you're putting other people's health in jeopardy potentially, correct? And it's the law, yeah. Yep, and it's the law, right? I mean, but it's this, you know, I want to drive that point home. I know a lot of times people can say, well, this is just another regulation to sort of, you know, encumber, you know, building owners at a very tough time. But we're talking about something that could potentially make people sick. So it's not only is it the law, but this is something that is is not just a, a, a this is extremely important for public health. We definitely want to do whatever we can to protect our, you know, our valuable drinking water and make sure it doesn't become contaminated. So this is a important step. Okay, great. All right, seeing that there are no other questions, um, 
I'll just say at this point, I look forward to working with DEP uh, on the implementation and, and sort of getting this bill right uh, with both the public advocate and, and my colleague in government who is now in the Queensborough presidency, Donovan Richards. I look forward to working with all of you together and Kate. I'm looking forward to April and seeing uh, the PACE program rolled out. Uh, do we have any, this last question I have is, do we see any, this, this, this conversation with DOF, how quickly can we get this done I know we'd want to probably roll out this program with 2170 as part of it. Yes, exactly. Um, I think that we can resolve this in the next couple of weeks. We can circle back with you too. Yes, I'd, I'd love to get this done as quickly as possible because if we are going to implement, if we are going to you know, have the PACE program for April, I'd want to make it as, as wide as possible and make sure that we're doing everything at once, right? Agreed completely, yes. Great, fantastic. So I look forward to working with you on this and everyone at MOS. And again, Kate, congratulations on your new role. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, Samara, I'll pass it back to you to call the next witnesses. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to the public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. <laughs> council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will, arms will give you the go ahead upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may, be, you may begin delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Michael Yaki, who is representing Petro Pace Financing LLC to be followed by Andrew Weber, with Twain Financial. Time starts now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your leadership uh, with the Climate Mobilization Act, uh, the largest carbon emissions reduction ever mandated by any city in the world. Uh, we really appreciate your support for the PACE program. I am with my Michael Yaki. I'm with Petros PACE Finance. We are one of the largest commercial PACE capital providers in the country. We're the people who actually are the private lenders who will be working with building owners uh, in New York City. And I wanna tell you right now that we already have been working with, with building owners in New York City. There are many who are ready to roll as soon as this program is launched. Uh, we're looking forward to helping you achieve your goals of climate change and GHG reductions. And uh, we're very happy with the work that has been done so far. The amendments that you provide in 2170 will help unlock that even more and, and actually make New York City a program consistent with most of the rest of the country that already has commercial pace. New construction is prevalent in the vast majority, in practice, almost all of the other states in the in communities in this country that have commercial pace. So this is gonna be great. Uh, we found it to be a very important part of how developers and financiers put together their capital stacks. And that makes it possible uh, to put in the kinds of improvements, the kind of energy efficiency changes that you want to see uh, in order to meet these climate goals. So again, I just wanna echo uh, what you have said. Uh, we're really looking forward for this program to launch as soon as possible. We have uh, basically, you know, property owners that are straining to get out, to get out, of, the, get out of the blocks and get going. Uh, these amendments will make it even, even even more accessible and better. And again, thank you for your leadership and uh, for your continued support. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Andy Weber of Twain Financial, uh, whose testimony will be followed by Laura Rappaport of Northbridge Ops. Time starts now. Hi all, uh, I echo all of uh, Michael Yaki's comments. Uh, I appreciate everyone's efforts to date on uh, making this program um, as successful as I think it's going to be. Um, as he mentioned, this will bring the program in alignment with um, several other PACE programs across the country. Uh, Twain is another private capital provider that will be you know, hopefully uh, you know, engaging in a number of successful transactions with uh, New York City's uh, business owners. So looking forward to uh, the potential to, uh, you know, interact with the program. And uh, I echo all the comments, um, you know, made so far on this call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> very much. 
um, Andy, and now your testimony will be followed by Laura Rappaport of Northbridge Arts, whose testimony will be subsequently followed by Alyssa Roth of Greenworks Lending. Time Hi. starts now. Hi, thank you so much for your time and your leadership and, and pushing this forward with um, 96 as well as 97. Uh, my name is Laura Rappaport. I'm managing partner of Northbridge Opportunities. I'm a former New York City real estate developer um, and currently active in the CPACE financing world. And we have, um, to Michael and Andy's point, many groups in New York who are very excited by this, certainly for new construction and certainly because they are trying very hard to enhance their projects with so many of these energy efficient measures that are so important to us. Um, I know firsthand how important the approval of this amendment is, having done both sides of this. And um, I think we, we, we must do everything we can to enhance the environmental sustainability measures for all building, including ground up construction. This is the future of our city and our collective legacy. We wanna make this a win-win for developers and owners so that instead of trying to figure out, can they afford this? they have the opportunity to go forward and really add to the positive future of New York. Um, I did also want to mention that in addition to funding green measures for a project, that CPACE can also act as non-predatory rescue capital, creating a liquidity injection into ongoing as well as future construction projects, many of whom have been stalled because of cost overruns because of COVID. And at present, CPACE does not allow this to transfer to new construction projects, which arguably are our city's most vulnerable since they're opening either right before COVID or during COVID. We need to give these projects every chance to succeed. Um, all those real estate sectors can benefit, uh, you know, as we talked about commercial, but I think also important to mention is hospitality. This is one of the few, CPACE is one of the few liquidity options for hospitality in, at the, in the market at present. Um, and given the lack of liquidity in the market, enabling CPACE for new construction will help to encourage these projects to be started and others in progress to be completed. This will create and sustain construction jobs as well as enhance projects to be completed so more jobs will be available at new hotels and at offices and multifamily projects, et cetera. Uh, certainly for life sciences, which I know is very important to the city. Um, CPACE will allow stalled projects an opportunity to be restarted and completed. It will also enable, uh, it will also further enable these projects to incorporate more of these measures. Uh, we spoke about the stretch code earlier to create a better and more sustainable city. This is also safer for the city so that there aren't stall projects, but can help create revenues for the city and state from the buildings as well as the tenants and the guests that occupy them. In short, CPACE is very flexible capital. It will allow the borrower to reallocate costs if they need to in a rescue capital. Um, it will be able to help people withstand this market volatility, which has been so damaging to date. Um, and lastly, you know, the long duration of the capital will keep so many of these building owners, you know, really helping to continue to enhance their buildings. I'm inspired. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Laura, and I would now like to welcome Alyssa Roth of Greenworks Lending, whose testimony will be followed by Terrence O'Brien of the Plumbing Foundation. Time starts now. Uh, thank you to the Committee on Environmental Protection and Council Member Constantinides for hearing public comments on this bill. Uh, my name is Alyssa Roth. I am the Senior Director of Policy for Greenworks Lending. We're the leading CPACE provider in the country with headquarters in Connecticut, San Francisco, and New York City. Um, we provide funding for clean energy projects exclusively through the CPACE structure, and we operate in all 25 of the active CPACE programs throughout the country. Um, I'm here to voice support for intro 2170 that will allow CPACE financing for clean energy measures on privately held new construction properties. Uh, this will allow environmentally sound new development in our city that may not occur if this bill is not enacted. Uh, CPACE is a successful financing tool that was enabled in New York State in 2009 and has benefited the existing building sector by reducing energy costs, improving building values, and cutting energy waste. Unfortunately, the current policy in New York City denies these benefits to new developments. Uh, intro 2170 simply amends the CPACE program to include new construction. There are 25 states in the country with closed CPACE projects, and every single one of them allows new construction. 
Uh, in April, when New York City launches their CPACE program, it will be the only active program in the United States that prohibits new development if this amendment is not passed. The state of New York has had an active CPACE program for four years, and that operates statewide with the exception of New York City, which will have an independent program. The state program identified a large volume of new construction projects they were forced to turn away, causing them to deny the economic development benefits of CPACE to communities throughout New York. Because of this, last year, New York State amended the CPA statute to allow new construction and extend these benefits to new developments. Intro 2170 brings the New York City ordinance into compliance with the updated state statute. CPA's policy has been present in New York State for years, but in a COVID environment, the lack of liquidity makes the need for this financing for new construction especially important to enabling stabilization of the real estate industry. Construction projects have slowed, business operations have been temporarily halted. Bill 2170 offers a pathway for immediate private investment into the building sector and construction sectors of our district without requiring any public funding or taxpayer dollars. Enabling CPACE for new construction will have an immediate impact on our local economy, opening the door for private capital to flow into our community and help get local construction workers and engineering firms back to work. There is no opposition to this. The policy behind CPACE is one of those rare instances where everyone is a winner, the local government, the business owners, and the local workforces. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alessa. Good to see you. Thank you, Alessa. And now I'd like to welcome Terrence O'Brien of the Plumbing Foundation. Is Terrence O'Brien here? Terrence O'Brien? Well, what about Loretta Hemphrey? If neither of those parties, Terrence O'Brien or Loretta Humphrey are here, um, I'd like to ask if there's anyone else who's registered to testify, but whose name I have not called. <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, I will now turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. Uh, I uh, Samara, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone who testified today. Uh, both of these bills uh, represent an agreement, an agreement um, from the administration and the council side that both bills, uh, one, the uh, increasing the fines and backflow devices and you know, adding new buildings to the CPACE program can be valuable to our city. Uh, so I look forward to working with the administration and the council to get these bills sure, done. I'm oh, so sorry. Before you close the hearing, there may be one more person who wants to testify from the Association of Contracting Plumbing, and I'm wondering if they need to accept the offer. Uh, um, if, if there's someone who wants to testify, I'm happy to let them testify if, if, that's, if they're ready. Okay. All right, so we'll... We'll let them testify and, and then we'll, we'll do the uh, time starts now. Can you identify yourself, please, before you testify? So now you're speaking to myself, it's Terrence O'Brien. Uh, hi. Hi, Terrence O'Brien. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> okay. I called problem. you before, but you didn't show up. Can I, you please offer your testimony now? I can. A little technical difficulty on my end here. Yes. Hello. My name is Terrence O'Brien. I'm the senior director of the Plumbing Foundation of the City of New York. The Plumbing Foundation uh, was founded in 1986, and it's a, a nonprofit organization of small, large uh, union and non-union plumbing contractors engaging uh, in uh, plumbing, engineering associations, supply houses, manufacturers, basically soup to nuts, uh, 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 plumbing related. But the auspices are focusing on uh, an acting of uh, proper plumbing codes and regulatory functions, maybe a DEP or DOB. Uh, I don't think I have to say too much. I have submitted testimony on this to topic numerous times, particularly I'm talking about intro 1576. 
Um, uh, I think the summary by the chair, uh, the borough president and his, and his prior road, and of course by the public advocate, his testimony today speaks volume on the issue. Uh, backflow, uh, proper backflow installations and, and functions and reporting and real monetary uh, penalties for non-compliance is a public health problem. Uh, and I think this uh, goes back to over almost a 20 year issue to figure out how to close the loop on it. And I will say I am strictly uh, personally very supportive of this bill. And also uh, I think uh, of uh, 1271, which I'm not commenting on publicly uh, uh, today on, I think is a good one as well. But in, 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 clo in closing, 1576 will go a long way to make sure uh, public health and public plumbing problems don't persist in the future by allowing uh, owners just to pay the minimum amount of fines instead of actually mitigating the problem and installing proper backflow devices. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Terrence, uh, is there anyone else who'd like to testify at this time? I had a name previously, Loretta Humphrey. Is she here? Okay. Seeing none, I will turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. Okay, well, I already began my closing remarks. So I'll just say at this time, I <laughs> want to thank, um, again, thank everyone who testified today and taking time out of their schedule to help us craft better legislation. Uh, so thank everyone for their testimony and their time. I want to thank uh, the administration for their partnership. I want to thank our staff who works tirelessly uh, Samara Swanston, our legislative attorney. Thank you, Samara, for all that you do. Uh, Nadia Johnson and Ricky Chala, who were texting me uh, to let me know that uh, council members were here. So thank you for all of your great work and all the work that you've done uh, to help prepare questions and get us ready for today's hearing all the reports. Thank you for all of your hard work. Uh, Jonathan Seltzer, our financial analyst. Jonathan, thank you for your work. Uh, Nicholas Wazowski, who's on vacation this week, my legislative council, but a well-earned vacation. Um, so thank you, Nick, for all of your hard work and to all of the uh, sergeant at arms uh, and our technical staff in the council who make all these Zoom meetings possible and make them go as seamlessly as they do. Uh, you know, thank you, everyone, for all of your hard work. And I saw Nicole and B. Thank you, Nicole, as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I will gavel this committee hearing of the Department of Environmental uh, the Department, uh, this committee hearing of the, the Committee on Environmental Protection closed. And with again, thank you to our speaker, uh, Corey Johnson, as well. So, hearing's closed.